our esteemed guests, Professor S. K. Bhatnagar, Vice Chancellor Ram Manohar Rohia National Law University, Lucknow, all the participants and the faculty colleagues, and of course, a warm um, welcome and good morning to our dean, sir, as well. So I welcome you all to the second day of the faculty development program on outcome oriented teaching, learning practices and research a multidimensional approach. As I said that today we have amongst us Professor S.K. Bhatnagar. Sir is the Vice Chancellor of Ram Manohar Lohia National Law University, Lucknow. Now, sir, it's an extreme privilege uh, to have you amongst us, and we are really looking forward to hear from you. But before we proceed any further, I would request Dean, sir, to please welcome our resource person for the session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ruchilal. It is a privilege to extend a very warm welcome to Honorable Professor S.K. Bhatnagar. Vice Chancellor Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia National Law University, Lucknow. In the morning session of the second day of FDP, outcome oriented teaching, learning practices and research, a multi dimensional approach. On day one yesterday, we are all uh, wish, uh, you know, fortunate to be you know, uh, in the audience of Professor Bakshi. And in his inaugural address, he emphasized entirely uh, upon reading of complete judgments by the faculty, and he went on to exhort that if law faculty shall not read judgments, then who else shall? So I'm sure we all will follow his uh, advice. And in the afternoon session, Professor Arthi Cole highlighted silent feature of the outcome based education. Professor Bhatnagar is a well known legal luminary, and we are very fortunate that uh, he is our mentor and he has served almost for four decades as professor of law in university departments. He was also the member of the first academic council of the National School Bangalore in the year 1987. He has been nominated by the Chief Justice of India as member of the Executive Council of the Indian Law Institute in the year 2006. Based on his long teaching and research experience, he has contributed immensely in many reputed institutions of repute, and the list is very long, uh, like academic bodies of Himachal Law, uh, National Law University, Assam National Law University, member of the academic body of the University of Delhi, AMU, Silchar Assam, Jammu, Patna, Asansol, West Bengal, Bhopal, Sirsa, Haryana, Nanita, Uttarakhand, Allahabad University, and Karnavati University. And Sir has been uh, in many selection committees of vice chancellors and other professors. Professor Bhatnagar has published around four dozen papers in the reputed journals and has edited many books. He has also been a uh, member of the editorial and advisory boards of the reputed law journals. Apart from these, he has been invited by the media to deliver several talks on legal and other issues. His special interests include legal aid, constitutional law, competitive constitution, legal literacy programs. We had the honor of welcoming Sir on the campus before Corona, and I remember uh, Sir was sharing a dais with uh, uh, former uh, Union Law Minister uh, Chad Bhardwaj, and in that session, Sir uh, took to uh, Article 39 and 40 of Magna Carta. And still I remember very nicely, sir, uh, told that uh, what are the main silent feature of these two articles. And this FDP, sir, intends to provide a platform of higher learning and very impressive faculty participation in this FDP reflects the zeal of the faculty to remain ahead of the learning curve, akin to a very smart woodcutter who keeps his axe in, very sh in a sharpening uh, position so that whenever he uses it, it is, uh, gives a desired result. With these words, sir, I, on my own behalf, and on behalf of the management, faculty, non-teaching staff, and the learned participants, once again welcome you in this FDP and express our deep gratitude, grat gratitude because whenever we request you, you are always uh, full of uh, kindness, and you always uh, grace the occasion. So with these words, sir, uh, thank you very much, and uh, you have spared a uh, precious time to share your pulse of wisdom. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, oh, sir. Now I would request you, sir, to please address the participants as we all are very eagerly waiting to hear from you. Sir, please. Thank you very much, Professor Kulshish and Dr. Ritchie. Very good morning to all the delegates and participants. Uh, the theme which has been allotted to me is uh, the scope of uh, comparative constitutional law in teaching. Now, today I have read in the newspaper that yesterday the Supreme Court decided, delivered 
44 judgments and on this feat of the Supreme Court, uh, some comments from former judges have come in media. And one of the comments given by uh, Gopal, Justice Gopal Goda is very remarkable and it is very relevant for uh, our topic of today. He says that during uh, summer vacation, there is time for the judges to rejuvenate and to understand the basics of law and constitution. And then he goes on to say that the comparative study of law, international law or constitutions is very relevant and the judges get time only during vacations and more particularly during summer vacation because it is longer. Otherwise, other vacations are not longer and uh, not much of time is available uh, to the judges for doing their studies. Then he goes on to say there are many other comments also. Uh, and the basic idea is that the summer vacation allows the uh, judges of the Supreme Court and High Court and uh, other courts also, no doubt about that, to broaden the legal understanding. That is to put in, in other words, it's not a question of knowledge, it's a question of understanding. When he says, uh, Justice Gopal Gauda, that uh, it is a time when the judge uh, gets an understanding of the basis of the law or constitutional law. So the comparative study broadens our horizon and that should be done in classroom studies also. Case law method is very good, but there is one defect in case law method that is that it does not take into account the moral issues involved in a judgment. It doesn't go for empathy, emotions, and other social needs of the society. It is more or less technical, and it tries to develop the legal acumen of the student. So when we talk about comparative study, what is the benefit of the comparative study, and why should we go for a comparative study of the constitutions uh, in the classrooms? The first thing is that we know our constitution is based on different constitutions. Uh, when our constitution was drafted, uh, the framers of the constitution, more particularly the drafting committee, had studied other constitutions also. So we can say that there is some kind of connect of our constitution with other constitutions. So when there is comparative study in the making of the constitution, why there should not be comparative study of constitutions when we are teaching in the classrooms? Secondly, uh, we also get a kind of a basis uh, for legal unification or legal harmonization. Now you have seen uh, that most of the laws or the legislations which are being enacted nowadays, they are defining the boundaries, the national boundaries. For example, if you are going to make a law on data protection, you will have to borrow or understand the things from other uh, jurisdictions also. So when uh, you find that you are to develop a law on e-commerce, when you have to deal with Twitter and you have to develop a legislation, it's natural that we are moving in the direction of legal uh, unification, you can say legal harmonization. And it is possible only uh, in the classroom if we go into the details or come at least the salient features of the uh, different constitutions and laws. Because I am focusing on constitutions, so I will be dealing with the constitutions. Nextly, you know it very well that uh, in recent times, uh, when this uh, idea of constitutional morality or uh, this transformative uh, constitution was being developed, uh, the judges have referred to the uh, ideas of different constitutions. Now, they have been uh, cited also, the, the foreign decisions have been cited in their judgments also. Why uh, they are going for all these judgments and all these jurisdictions? because uh, of the fact that this kind of a study would assist the judges in resolution of difficult questions. 
Now, what are the difficult questions? Difficult questions are posed in hard cases. And you know, when one judge or anybody is dealing with a hard case, then uh, we can easily recall what the dictum or what kind of principle or guideline or guidance has been given by Ronald Dorkin that it is the duty of a judge to construct a moral and political theory underlying uh, that uh, constitution because I am dealing with constitution. So there may be some kind of, uh, uh, you can say, uh, a kind of overlapping. When we say overlapping, that means that there are certain similarities and there are the certain dissimilarities. So if we go into that, uh, uh, teacher goes into that in the classroom, we will be in a better position to understand our own uh, setting, our own constitution. For example, recently this decision on abortion has been given by the American Supreme Court. And in that case, uh, you will find that that is very startling for uh, Indian uh, people. Uh, on the one hand, we say the American society is very open is not conservative, but how come that after 50 years uh, they are making a backward movement by saying that the constitution does not allow right to abortion, number one. Number two, uh, it is said that this uh, uh, particular uh, kind of choice or you can say entitlement, it belongs to the people, that it goes back to the people and then they say that it goes back to the states. Now, if we compare this, uh, I mean, uh, decision with the decisions or the medical termination of Pregnancy Act of uh, India, we will find that despite many similarities, there are certain problems also. Problematic areas are because if we are dealing only with the decision, we will not be able to understand the basis of uh, these differences because when we talk about constitutional morality, we are focusing on women rights. But the American Supreme Court is not talking about constitutional morality. It is talking about the societal morality, which belongs to people. So you can see the difference that Article 21, which allows right to life and liberty in India, is more or less same uh, if we go for text as given in the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America, but there are many striking differences. So we will have to compare these two, uh, I mean, jurisdictions to understand the basis of a particular right, that is women right. But how come that they are not focusing on women right when we have liberalized uh, this uh, right to abortion because there was no right uh, it was a penal, uh, I mean, provision. There was a penal provision in the Indian Penal Code. So uh, when it uh, this law in 1971 came, then uh, it was realized that we are talking about the choice of a woman, of, of a woman, or women autonomy, or right to life under Article 21. So why this is the difference? So for that, uh, again, I will uh, bring to you a comparative study which has been done very recently during COVID-19. And in that uh, case, uh, what has happened that uh, one professor from Australia, uh, he is Paul Baby, Paul, P-A-U-L, Paul Baby, B-A-B-I-E. He is professor in Adelaide Law School, and he has uh, uh, compared the judicial approaches of uh, four or five Supreme Courts, or you can say high courts, you can say the apex courts in uh, four or five countries, that how these courts dealt with religious freedom, right to religious freedom during COVID-19. So I am not going to religious freedom. I am just bringing the basic facts or basic approaches of these different high Supreme Courts or apex courts, that how they dealt with the same problem of COVID-19 in different ways. For example, India. Now the Indian judiciary, according to this comparative study, was very proactive. 
and why was it so proactive because it took covid-19 pandemic as a problem of human rights because if you can recall the uh, uno chief had also declared that it is not health crisis it's a human rights crisis now in the same way the indian supreme court took it as a human rights crisis because migrant workers were moving from uh, different places uh, in dif from different states to their home states so uh, what was involved in all these situations of migration or uh, losing job that was right to life right to food right to movement right to shelter right to livelihood and that is why the indian supreme court had taken sumo to cognizance no other uh, supreme court or the apex court did like this why because the approach of the indian supreme court was oriented towards human rights now uh, he uh, gives example of the american supreme court also the american supreme court though had put itself in in the central position of the issue it didn't say that we are not uh, concerned about it but then they put a rider on their uh, intervention and that rider was a ground for intervention that if the constitutional provisions are being violated or in other words if the constitutional principles the principles underlying the constitution they are violated we will intervene and you can recall how uh, donald trump versus the democrat governors crisis had happened during uh, that period of time and the indian oh, sorry american supreme court or the american judiciary did not intervene because they could not see any kind of violation of the constitutional principles then uh, he uh, makes uh, uh, a study of uh, canadian supreme court and australian high court because there the apex court is the high court of australia commonwealth of australia there were striking similarities between the approaches of these two uh, courts canadian and australian i mean that they adopted a policy of deference to political decision they came to the conclusion look here this is a administrative arena we will have deference to the political decisions being taken by the government we will not intervene so easily so here you see on the one hand or end of that spectrum you find the indian supreme court taking an extreme position saying that it is a human rights crisis and going also sue moto on the other side of the spectrum you find the canadian and australian uh, courts saying that we have respect for political decisions we we think that it is a political decision so we are not going to intervene interfere in all these things because all these things are policy decisions they didn't take into account the human rights perspective at all and in the middle you will find though it is on the side of the canadian and uh, australian courts judiciary uh, was the american judiciary which was saying that look here we could put ourselves in the uh, central position we are here in the uh, zone we are not outside it but if the political decisions taken by uh, the government say the president or the congress or the governors is if these decisions are going against the constitutional provisions or uh, the uh, constitutional principles because they meant by that not only the american constitution but the state constitutions also so here you would find that this kind of a study is very much relevant in the classroom we have discussed and we will discuss in this semester the decisions taken by the indian judiciary so far as the uh, question of covid-19 is concerned if you have to make a study of covid-19 uh, and uh, supreme court or indian judiciary or you say fundamental rights during covid-19 or you can say federalism uh, during uh, covid-19 now there can be a study of comparative federalism also if you can recall that when this covid-19 struck uh, 
started from China, then it went to Europe, and then to North America, and then uh, it came to Asia. It's like that India, I mean by that. So in Europe, you will find that Germany was doing the best out of all the European countries in controlling this uh, COVID-19. Why I am referring to Germany? Because Germany is a federation. Then uh, USA, in the United States of America, there is a federation and then India also. I will take India also and I will make a comparative study of all these three, uh, I mean, areas. So in Europe, uh, you will find that German uh, constitution was beautiful used by uh, the Chancellor of uh, Federal Republic of Germany, uh, Angela Merkel, and there was no dispute between the federal government and the state governments. When we come to United States of America, we find uh, that Donald Trump was at loggerheads, if you can say so, uh, was always in conflict with the governors of uh, democratic states. Uh, I mean, Democrat governors of different states. And the famous uh, conflict was between the New York governor, Cuomo, who was a Democrat, and Donald Trump, who was a Republican. Was there any fault in the Constitution, whether it requires for any kind of amendment in the Constitution? I am not taking up this question. I come to India. In India, you know, again, it is a federation. Now, if you compare it with the, this uh, Germany, or USA, you will find it was not worse as the USA uh, Federation was doing in those times, but it was not better than uh, Federal Republic of Germany also. I am talking about the functioning of uh, uh, the uh, federalism. I am talking about comparative federalism. In India, you know what has happened when migrant workers uh, uh, were moving, then no government, state government I am talking about, uh, was ready to take the responsibility. A blame game started. Maharashtra saying that these Biharis have come, they have worked here, and uh, they have earned here, and now it is the responsibility of Bihar or Uttar Pradesh government, and they should provide for their migration, they should provide uh, their for their food during transit, and they should do all the things which are required for their welfare. It's not our duty. And these home states, uh, Bihar, UP, from where these uh, labor has migrated to these uh, states, uh, their contention was that you have earned through their labor when they were working in your uh, factories or in your shops or, or, or in your establishments, you were getting enriched by rent of their labor. So you have a moral responsibility for that. And there was another argument that the center should intervene. So who would uh, ferry them? Who would transport them? This was in dispute. And that's why that Sonu Sood had come in, uh, as an NGO, you can say. But uh, it showed the cracks in our federalism. In the first wave, the central government had taken the lead despite the fact uh, that there was nothing in the constitution to give that authority, but because there was a law on national disaster, under that they have done. In the second wave, the uh, responsibilities were given to the states. And in the third wave, even to the units and the, to the district commissioners. Now the question arises, whether it requires any kind of, uh, uh, I mean, amendment in the constitution. We talk about cooperative federalism. We, we say that American constitution or federalism is a competitive or classic, a classical federalism, and ours is a cooperative model. But what kind of this cooperative model was? Because cooperative federalism, if it was there at all, then it was put to test. And the uh, sector was not giving direction to the states uh, in the second and the third phase. So this particular thing, when we are talking, uh, uh, all these things, uh, or we are discussing all these things in, in our uh, classrooms, we have to talk about them also uh, for uh, having a comparative look. Because the judges, when they are in this vacation, they have a comparative look. It doesn't mean that they must follow. They can distinguish, keeping in view the uh, social needs or difference uh, in uh, 
culture also or in uh, requirements also in the uh, conditions also but we get a very good idea of operation of different uh, constitutional provisions in different provisions because uh, different jurisdictions because they are patterned on uh, more or less same uh, language so the question uh, arises that should it be done because there are some uh, people some jurists who say that it should not be done why it should not be done because that means that we are not respecting our framers why it is so because of the fact that the making of law is the job of the legislature and when judges are delivering their judgments which are based on foreign judgments then it is undemocratic also and it it, it is not legitimate because what is legitimate is that it should be in consonance with our constitution in consonance with original intention of the framers of the constitution so the first charge which is leveled against those who go for comparative study to borrow or to learn to understand the foreign constitutions or foreign uh, jurisdictions is this that it is undemocratic and it goes against uh, the uh, spirit of uh, the uh, basic uh, understanding or intention of the framers that is one thing but then there is a counter argument also for example if you take uh, human rights now that is the most important part of the uh, indian constitution and so is uh, the case with the american or australian or canadian constitution you will find that uh, the language uh, which is used for guaranteeing uh, human rights is more or less same so uh, all the constitutions of the world uh, which uh, profess to be uh, democratic in nature uh, going for welfare state uh, they are influenced by udhr and uh, most of the constitutions in africa and in asia also they are modeled i'm talking about human rights provisions they are modeled on udhr we are party to covenants we are party to various conventions on human rights so we understand that the international human rights treaties or documents they have to be internalized in the uh, in, in the domestic jurisdiction also not only uh, in the law making not only in adjudicating the cases not only in interpreting the uh, provisions but also in the classrooms because uh, the the students learn all these things in classrooms then they go for litigation they go uh, on the bench or they go for legal advising all these things uh, they may do but what they get in the classroom that uh, makes a lot of difference but that opens vista for their understanding of different provisions say for example article 21 because now a days when we are talking about globalization that means sharing we are sharing not only commerce we are sharing the constitutional ideas also so we have got a shared framework and when the questions arise in different jurisdictions the questions are also more or less same for example free speech now twitter facebook data protection all these things are related to right to uh, freedom of speech and expression right to press right to privacy so the questions are same so if the questions are same it is not necessary that the answers must be same because you cannot find right answers what is the right answer in case of abortion now you say uh, you you see in case of united states of america the answer is that a woman will not be allowed to go for abortion the question is same whether the uh, uh, woman has got a right to abortion or not the same question is here that whether a woman has got a right to abortion or not the question is same but the answer in india is different it's a legal answer it's a judicial uh, i mean uh, response that yes a woman has a right to go for abortion it is not written specifically anywhere but she has a right to uh, privacy she has a right to personal autonomy decisions 
she has a right to be let, uh, left alone. All these things relating to morality also, that the, the public morality, religious morality cannot eat away her right to abortion. This comes from constitutional morality. So the, the questions are same, but the answers may be different. But the language is the same. So when, when provision is same, the question is same, we, we have commonalities, we have differences also. So we must go uh, for understanding why it has happened so in the United States of America, a so liberal society, so open society, that they have gone for this kind of uh, interpretation. And then you will know the difference uh, between uh, the two jurisdictions, and that is beneath the legal provision that is to be found in the society, uh, in the uh, public uh, civil society, and you will find that we are more oriented towards women rights, at least in 21st century, at least in concrete matters, and there they are talking about the Roman Catholic doctrine, the uh, morality coming from the religion, and we are talking about morality coming from constitution. So we can talk about a comparative constitutional morality also. If we can talk about uh, globalization at the comparative, uh, at the global level, then why not co global comparative or uh, constitutional mo morality? Because in the basis uh, or in the foundations of all these decisions, when we are talking about making a moral and constitutional theory, uh, as Dorkin has exhorted all of us, then we will see uh, that we have to have some kind of common uh, global culture also, which is comparative culture, you can say. So it is one thing that when we have the same source, UDHR, Covenants, Convention of Human Rights, International Human Rights uh, uh, documents, then we can have same approach also. Is it possible? This is one thing. Second thing is that you will see the difference in the phrases also. For example, Article 21, when it was being drafted, all of you know, this is a very famous, uh, I mean, kind of thing uh, that uh, we did not borrow or did not insert due process. Instead, we took this due procedure established by law. So here you see the difference in language. If there is difference in language, what, what is the meaning of that? And sometimes what happens that you borrow the same thing uh, from some other culture, but your interpretation is very different. For example, if you take the directive principle state policy, in directive principle state policy, you, we have borrowed from Ireland. But if you compare uh, the uh, directive principle state policy uh, of uh, 21st century in India with that of uh, Ireland, you will see a lot of uh, differences. Uh, why it is so, even if the language is same or language is different, because it is, uh, we see that our history is different, our culture is different, our institutions are uh, different. The, the way our institutions function, for example, take Indian judiciary, it is altogether different from uh, other powerful uh, institutions uh, like the Supreme Court of uh, uh, United uh, States of America, Supreme Court of uh, Canada, even uh, the now it is uh, Supreme Court earlier, it was House of Lords of United Kingdom because it is difference in the approach. So th these approaches should also be learned in the classroom and we should also go for that. And nextly, when uh, there is a question of balancing, because what is what the Supreme Court or any court does balancing? Why it has to go for balancing? Because there are two parties. A party says that uh, it is covered under this provision, B party says it is not covered, or vice versa, it can be there. One party says it's a question of right, individual right. Another party says it is a question of public interest or social control. So uh, balancing is to be done. So when balancing is being done, that cannot be done on the basis of the text only. That is to be done on the basis of the domestic, I mean, uh, circumstances. That is why this is the difference. So when we are talking, we are discussing, <coughs> excuse me, and if <coughs> for a judgment, then uh, we have to look into the domestic circumstances also. So when 
we think about constitutionalism that is another area i would like to take into uh, account that is about the uh, global uh, framework uh, or the global uh, uh, idea we, we want to make because the question arises why to compare what will you get if you compare one thing we discussed that we get a better legal understanding that we are in a better position to resolve our own disputes. But think why, why to have this kind of comparative outlook? Then the goal can be, though it is a part fest, it may be in utopia, but even then we want to have a global framework, global framework for certain legal provisions. So how it can be done? Uh, in a comparative understanding of constitutional law, uh, class, I can say. Uh, first of all, we have to understand that our first goal or in the uh, initial stages is not for convergence. Convergence means should that it should be in some way uniform. Uniformity is not desirable, at least in the first uh, stage. Uh, and uh, maybe it, it may be because of this that we are not going to have uniform civil code so early. Though we are talking about that because we are talking about convergence only. But instead of convergence, rather than convergence, we should try to have mutual cooperation. I'm not talking about uniform civil code anymore. That comparative law actually awakens the classroom, the judges, the legislators to potential which is latent in their own legal system. Now, there was one potential in our own legal system, in our constitutional system, but that was realized after 30 years of the making of the constitution or adoption of the constitution. That was PIA, public interest litigation. Now, PIA is a unique innovation of the Indian judiciary. Now, how could it be possible? It could be possible when we looked at different, uh, I mean, uh, work, different systems, uh, indigenous system, uh, what you call a justice at the doorsteps, a justice with human face. We developed the idea of uh, uh, PIL. And this was a potential which was hidden in our constitution since the beginning, that is 26 January 1950. But it could not be realized. It was realized afterwards. And it was possible only when we went into the moorings and fundamental foundations of our, our constitution that Article 32, it doesn't say that the person who has been injured, that is whose right has been violated, only he can approach the court. Because the duty of the Supreme Court or the responsibility which has been cast upon our Supreme Court is to enforce fundamental rights. Who comes? That is not a question. And that is not stratified in uh, Article 32. It's open. Article 32 has got an open structure. Whether it was deliberate or not, that's a different thing. But there was a potential in Article 32 which was realized. And you know that after that, uh, other jurisdictions are also going to follow. Another example is basic structure. Basic structure was underlined. The theory was already there when we commenced with this constitution on 26 January 1950. Not realized in Shankri Prasad, not realized in Sajjan Singh, not realized in uh, Golaknath case. All of a sudden it is realized when the Supreme Court was put to pressure to do something because parliament was uh, I mean, according to some of the jurists of uh, those times, was overstepping the limits. So they realized and they found that particular potential in our constitution. Applying Marbury versus Madison, we talked about the foundational principles. Applying the Bonger case decided by Lord Coke 400 years ago, that it is the duty of the uh, judiciary to uh, go into the public manners and the foundations of the society. And then we came 
with this basic structure theory. And this basic structure theory, now it has been imported by uh, other jurisdictions also. Bangladesh is one of the prime examples for that. Pakistan also, but some say that Pakistan had done it before. It was not known to, uh, in the sense, what not visible uh, on the four. That's why uh, it cannot be uh, marked. That's a different thing. Nextly, when we are discussing the our uh, discussing our constitution, and we rope in the other constitutions also. So what happens? that in, it informs the classroom, the teachers, us also, judges also, about the successes and failures by adopting a different kind of solution. That is, during COVID-19, different Supreme Courts, Apex Courts, adopted different legal solutions. God forbid, if after 50 years, same situation arises, uh, hum log nahi honge tam, after 100 years, if the same situation arises, I think the, uh, I can say that maybe that the American Supreme Court adopts the approach of the Indian Supreme Court. An Indian Supreme Court may approach the, uh, may adopt the approach of the Australian Court. Why? Because we learn from the successes and failures of other decision by adopting a particular solution, whether it has worked well or not. Because if the American Supreme Court realized after 50 years that the right to abortion should not have been allowed, and it did so, it overruled. Now what happens next? That's a different thing. But trial and error uh, goes on. But it can be done only if we have a broader outlook. If you are uh, thinking uh, in a very narrow manner, in a pedantic manner, then our solutions will not be good. So when we are discussing about solutions in the classroom, in the case law method, it happens, and we talk about legal solutions, I would appeal that we should discuss the, the morality aspect also, the emotions also, empathy also, all these things. Whether a woman who has been raped and has fearing pregnancy, whether she should not be allowed abortion or not. There are many situations. This is the extreme situation I am talking about. So all these things are to be discussed because we can say MTP is a law and we can analyze it with legal acumen. No, we have to analyze it with other uh, understanding also, moral, political, social, cultural uh, understandings, underpinnings. And for that, we can take help from other jurisdictions also. I, I, I think I have taken enough time, 45 minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have to cut it short, but anyway, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for, so much, sir. So we can have uh, take some questions with your kind permission from participants. Yes, sure, sure. That's why I've left 15 minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So there's a question by a participant that what should be the deciding factor for differentiating the matters of public policy with the issues of human rights? How far the use of Article 142 to do complete justice by the Supreme Court is justified? First of all, the Supreme Court never says that it is entering into the domain of public policy. Because public policy is the domain of the executive. They will decide the public policy. But any policy, any legislation, any instrument, if it affects, violates the uh, human rights, then it will step in. So this is very clear. And what was the second part? 142. Yes. Sir. Okay, 142 is something we should be used in special cases only. It cannot be used for judicial legislation. It can be used for filling the gaps. You know, in interpretation, we discuss casus omissus. Uh, so if the dots have 
to be joined with a particular line. So if a particular dot is missed or is missing, then a dot can be fixed there and line can be joined. It is possible. So 142 talks about complete justice. That means the legal justice in some situations uh, can be incomplete and something is to be added. So if it is in the line of the uh, legal justice uh, that is permissible, that should be done. But what is what has happened in recent times is that even in easy cases, I am comparing it with hard cases. Uh, in easy cases also, Article 42 has been roped in, and you know the jurists and the academicians and some judges are also worried about this kind of practice using 142 where it is not desirable. But when Supreme Court does it, then it is final, it can be fallible. There is no doubt about that. So question is very good, but uh, there are no clear cut answers for that. So there's another question. Uh, what challenges a researcher may face while doing a comparative constitutional law studies research? First is language. Now, there are very good things in German constitution. Federal Republic of uh, Germany. But if we do not know Germany, uh, German, then this is one difficulty. Second difficulty is that if you study only the constitution, not the society, then you will not get to the depth of this provision. Because every legal provision is part of the political system. Because legal system or constitutional system, they are based on political system, political systems are based on social systems and social systems are based on culture systems. So they are uh, interconnected. So much of, uh, I mean, uh, feeding uh, would come from all these uh, systems underlying them because we cannot forget that this uh, law or constitution is a kind of a superstructure. I am not going into Marxism uh, totally. But uh, one truth of uh, Marxism is that law is a superstructure in the base is society, economic history, all the things. So, you know, uh, if you read Cardozo, then you will find there are many ways of uh, interpretation and history is also there. Sociology is also there. So when we are going for comparative study, we will encounter all these difficulties of language, of understanding of the culture, because every constitution is rooted in its settings, which may be cultural, which may be social, which may be political, which is peculiar in all the societies. Yes. Thank you, uh, sir. I think there is no other question from the participants. So one question, one question, uh, if my, if I may add, uh, sir, the power of CU Mito taking cases by. Uh, Apex code in India. Uh, does it violate uh, the separation of power? And this is not seen in developed uh, countries so frequently. As you mentioned, COVID. In COVID, I saw uh, developed economies, their courts were uh, not resorting to CMTO judgments. Uh, that is the study which uh, I pointed out, uh, I uh, discussed here of these uh, four jurisdictions. And the Indian Supreme Court was in a way, or the judiciary was very different, that it was taking Suboto cognizance. The ground was the uh, human rights. And uh, you know, Article 32 PIL is there. If any person can approach the court, why the judge of the Supreme Court cannot approach uh, its own court like that? First, uh, that may be the legal justification for that. But when we come to separation of powers, uh, yes, it uh, seems uh, that it violates separation of powers and it does create problem uh, for the government also because uh, giving a particular direction to the government uh, looks very good, uh, but it has financial implications also, great financial uh, implications also. So in that sense, uh, I think the uh, Supreme Court could have uh, uh, taken cognizance of all these facts, but during COVID-19, it seems uh, it was not there. But there is another theory also, which has developed on separation of powers, uh, 
that is uh, in the realm of critical legal studies cls crits uh, there roberto unger who is the main proponent i believe so of uh, critical legal studies he says it is not separation of powers why do you talk about powers first of all it is separation of functions this word power is a misnomer so we should take it as functions secondly he has uh, suggested or proposed an idea of not separation of powers but overlapping of powers overlapping of powers and it happens all these three organs do not operate in strict exact compartments there are checks and balances also the judges are appointed by the executive so the the, the parliament uh, uh, can go for impeachment of a supreme court judge or high court judge so check and balance is there we should move further that is overlapping of separation of powers it is in theory it has not happened anywhere and i think that uh, the judiciary must have taken some kind of caution when it was going for uh, covid 19 uh, cases and suomoto cases uh, violating separation of powers i wish it will not happen again if uh, something covid 24 or covid 44 doesn't come <laughs> thank you very much sir for very uh, uh, enlightening uh, session Uh, sir, in the meanwhile, I think one of the participants have again posted a question. If I may, please. Um, so, how should we start comparative study? Should we start with the primary sources like the constitution or legislation, or the secondary sources like articles? Is there any specific source, journal, etc.? You have to go. the provision wise if you are studying for example right to life so a uh, celebrated case of man versus people of illinois right to life does not mean animal existence so it depends upon the topic upon the theme which you have chosen for a study maybe that you go for judicial decisions so there cannot be one i mean approach for that which can be suggested for having comparative study if you are studying uh, federalism then uh, only the provisions will give you much light no doubt about that but if you are going for a particular right for example right to health so right to for right to health you will have to go for international uh, documents also and decisions also so uh, i would say that you must study the constitutions of different worlds also and if one can recall that dd basu had 20 plus volumes on constitution of india and whenever any article was discussed in the first few pages the similar or dissimilar provisions of different constitutions were discussed his way of Uh, telling or discussing any article was first to tell what are the provisions in different constitutions and then coming to india so that approach can be taken thank you thank you sir um it's really been a very enlightening lecture and i'm sure all the participants here would have gained immensely and they would be utilizing the knowledge gained from your session in their research and in their classroom teaching as well thank you so much sir for sparing your time and being with us for the session thank you sir and sir during your next visit to ncr please come to our campus okay, for one to one thank you sir good day sir my problem my problem thank you bye thank you sir namaskar sir